The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon, all. I think you can see me and Bert. Um, it's me again, Art Junkers, uh, Corporate Country Sales Manager for Corporate Sales Benelux, together with, uh, with Bert. Bert uh, Berta Hauer, our Senior Pre-Sales Engineer. And today we are going to host uh, a webinar for you, uh, our second webinar of this year. And the agenda is as follows. First, I will shortly introduce F-Secure uh, to those that don't know us yet or don't know us that well. But uh, as said, very shortly, uh, because most of the time is uh, reserved for our CISO, uh, Erika Koivunen, uh, who already told some of you a bit about GDPR some weeks ago. But especially for, for us, uh, for the Belgium and, uh, and the Netherlands, um, he will deep dive into this topic, which is very actual at the moment. And hopefully um, you will have a lot of outcomes. And in the end, there will be some room for questions and answers. Maybe those are GDPR related. Maybe those are product related with regard um, to our products. Uh, and then uh, Bert is here as well um, to cover those, uh, those questions. So if we uh, continue, a bit about F-Secure, uh, as said, very short, we are a Nordic, uh, a Finland-based uh, cybersecurity vendor uh, that was established in 1988. And most of you might know us um, from our endpoint security products, uh, as we have won test results uh, a couple of years now uh, and are already selling this, this product since 1988. Uh, in the beginning, mainly through big operator partners and now expanding into the corporate business uh, big time as well. Uh, and the last years, we expanded our product portfolio to other products as well that go beyond, beyond the endpoint security uh, and goes into the, the, the predicting and the responding to cyber attacks as well. Uh, 1,000 employees, 25 countries, so we, we cover all the world, uh, but of course, uh, we have the biggest focus on uh, on Europe, so on you as our uh, as our customers. When you look at our current product portfolio, um, uh, as I told you, it all started with our endpoint uh, offering uh, products that you might be familiar with, like Business Suite, protection service for business. Uh, but since um, some time now, um, we expanded our uh, security portfolio also to the predict side. Uh, and Erica, for sure, will tell you a bit more about that. Uh, but with our product, Radar, which is a vulnerability management solution that um, lets you know your attack surface. So what are my weak points in my cyber defense and what should I uh, recover? Uh, and then, of course, you can recover those, uh, for example, with our endpoint solutions, uh, the prevent part. And on top of that, um, we have uh, sophisticated solutions for the detecting and the responding to targeted cyber attacks. So if it uh, goes wrong, and this can always happen, uh, whether what endpoint or firewalling solutions you are using, we have the solution um, to uncover uh, cyber attacks and to resolve and to mitigate them. Um, so a complete product portfolio, uh, but today, um, we will cover some of those products, but we will mainly talk about GDPR that will be, uh, well, not introduced, that, that will be effective as of uh, next year. And uh, especially of interest, I think, today that we have our own CISO, uh, Erika, who will tell a bit more about GDPR because he's also involved from an F-Secure point of view. What do we need to do and how have we done it? So he has lots of expertise. Uh, and he will guide you through um, some, um, yeah, some bullet points that we prepared, uh, like how can you prepare, um, how can you identify breaches and attackers, um, why does detection matter, and where does incident response come in. So he will cover those topics. Um, as said, if you have any questions, um, please um, put them in the chat. Uh, there's a possibility to put them in the chat. We will uh, answer them. We will try to answer them, if possible, of course, uh, at the end of the webinar, uh, or uh, contact one of uh, one of our team uh, later on if you have questions or remarks uh, or whatsoever. Um, Going further, um, we are now trying um, to go to Erka. He's in Finland. We are in the Benelux. 
Um, so this might take some uh, some seconds, uh, but we will give the word to Erka, and he will do his uh, GDPR part. Uh, and later on this uh, this webinar, we will come back to you uh, with some uh, questions and uh, and answers. Erka, you are able to uh, show your screen, so I hope you have your uh, microphone unmuted. Okay, we can see your screen, that's one thing. Only you have to unmute yourself. Um, I hope I have unmuted myself already. Excellent. We no. can hear you. Yes. Great. This is a good success so far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm assuming that floor is mine now. Yes. All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Erika Koivunen, and I'm the CISO of F-Secure, which is uh, in itself, I guess you could argue that it's either a blessing or a curse to be a CISO for a company that works in the field of cybersecurity. I have lots of advice from our staffers. They know it way better than I do. At least sometimes it feels like. And yet when you have a thousand strong staff of information security specialists, the incidents that they cre create are quite wild and imaginative at a time. So there's never a dull moment in my work. So the, today's topic is about uh, implementation of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, and how a CISO would look at that topic. Um, in F-Secure, I have uh, my responsibility covers both IT and network security and privacy as well as our software security. So uh, I have a pretty broad uh, responsibility in that sense. In some companies, CISO is more of a, in a, in a supporting function, which would make it a bit more limited uh, in terms of implementation. Uh, but let's begin with the, uh, reiterating the sense of urgency. GDPR as an European Union regulation took some four or five years to pass through the, the maze in Brussels. So in theory, you could argue that all the companies within the European Union had plenty of time to prepare for the, the uh, adaptation of new regulation and yet now that it is slightly less than a year to actually implement all the necessary security controls and privacy processes, I'm, I'm now sensing that there are some companies that feel that they would want to have some more time. And I guess if you approach uh, compliancy to GDPR as a project, you should be aware that there's actually a limited amount of working days left for you to implement the necessary requirements. So you would hope that people will stay healthy and, and that you would not have to spend excess time in recruiting people just to be in, in the know. All right, uh, word and this is, I think this is something that is worthy, worth reminding information security managers time and time again. Most companies are not there to do information security. They actually have a legitimate business to run. And information security provides controls that help the company to achieve those business goals. So information security and the controls you implement, they are a means to an end, not the end itself. And in this case, we have some data protection objectives that the law requires us to uh, meet and to prove 
and we need to have some information security controls that support that. So in that sense, as a CISO, as an information security officer, in, in if you in any fashion do not hear anything about GDPR during the next year, you should be you should be feeling a bit uh, worrisome, and you should start investigating what's what's taking place in your company. So as Art uh, showed you earlier, we call this cycle. Uh, uh, live security, and it require it. It wants to emphasize that our approach to cybersecurity is a holistic one. We want companies to move away from merely applying preventative solutions, which I call set and forget type of solutions. And we are urging the companies and organizations to understand what types of threats they are facing, what kinds of threats they are exposed to, and accept the fact that accidents happen, breaches will take place, and you are going to run your business using buggy, outdated software that contains vulnerabilities, and not all your people are doing the best and best possible uh, work every day, every time and 100% of the time. So you will have plenty of opportunities of being hacked into and it's necessary that you have a capability to detect and respond accordingly. And when we move our focus from this marketing slide to the GDPR requirements, this is a valiant attempt of our privacy officer to, to draw which types of controls and requirements the regulation would require us to implement and how they would fit into this holistic view of cybersecurity. So uh, I will walk through this picture during the presentation. So let's begin by preparing and understanding what is it that that we're going to, what kind of task we have at uh, hand. So, according to the regulation, you actually need to identify whether you are acting as a, in a controller role, or whether you are processing somebody else's data. Controller takes ownership of the data, and processor, they are actually working for a master i.e. a controller that is outside their uh, domain of control. And in the webinar that Art mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago, we actually had an extensive discussion about this in terms of uh, likening GDPR to what is already uh, learned from PCI. Normal businesses, when they are handling payments data, they actually are not at all interested in storing, handling, and verifying the payment card data. They would actually want to outsource the processing of such sensitive data to somebody else. So in that sense, the business that is interested in doing commerce would be the controller, and they would outsource the payment processing to a processor. And you could actually adopt similar kind of approach to data processing according to GDPR as well. So you might want to, for instance, outsource the implementation of your um, uh, customer database and CRM management to an outsourced cloud service, for instance, Salesforce. And that would put Salesforce in the processor mode, and you would be not relieved from responsibility, of course, but you would be relieved from the, the ugly details of how to set up a secure service, how to make sure that there are security controls in place, and how to actually prove that you are uh, compliant to the regulation. 
uh, if your data processing needs are more complicated than what is readily available, you of course need to accept the fact that you will need to build custom applications and you would need to take the processing load onto yourself as well. And in that sense, you need to implement all the security features as well so, so that you would be uh, compliant. And um, the preparations in this sense would fall into the predict and prevent category. You would need to identify what types of threats there are to your business. And you would need to perform so-called privacy impact assessments, which are outlined in the Article 35 of GDPR. And whenever you are designing data processing, whether that would be data intake, data storage, data processing, or sharing of data, or removing of data, you would actually need to apply uh, privacy conscious processes throughout the life cycle of the data. You also would need to be in a position to prevent accidents and breaches and uh, attacks in advance. So you would need to be resilient enough to withstand uh, attacks, disruptions, uh, human mistakes and software glitches in a fashion that the effects would be isolated or, uh, if possible, even non-existent. And you would need to be in a position to grant access to authorized persons only and be rest assured that unauthorized people will need to force their way in so that they at least leave a mark in the system if they try to breach the security of it. So let's move on to address what kind of attackers there would be and what types of breaches you would uh, face. And I guess at this point of time it would be worthwhile to mention that um, in our Business Security Insider blog post or series of blog posts, there are four articles that I wrote uh, some time ago about how GDPR actually makes it mandatory for organizations to start preparing for the event of them being breached or at least to the uh, uh, likely event that there will be an uh, attempt to breach your systems. And I, I will walk through the steps of how to actually identify when you would need to start notifying authorities and customers and how to make sure that there will be enough evidence uh, in store so that you can actually identify the root cause uh, of the attack and uh, reconstruct what the attacker did once they were in the system. So uh, we will be happy to send a link to those articles uh, afterwards. All right. In the cybersecurity industry, I guess it's fashionable to, to paint the picture that the threats are complicated and the threat actors are advanced and sophisticated and that you alone will never be a match for the uh, determined attacker. Hence, you would need to turn to uh, uh, professional help such as cybersecurity companies uh, like F-Secure. And in reality, most organizations will be uh, targeted by pretty opportunistic and non-targeted attacks and surprisingly big portion of those attacks will be successful. So uh, the, the hype word of the industry is of course APT, Advanced Persistent Threat, but 
what actually will hit most organization can be described as basic opportunistic threat, which, which uh, Mr. Scott Stanton quite eloquently put in his Twitter post some time ago already. Uh, an example of highly effective, highly damaging and highly prevalent opportunistic threat would be ransomware. Uh, this picture has been taken from our uh, previous State of Cybersecurity report that we published uh, in the beginning of this year. This is an attempt to uh, visualize ransomware criminal gangs according to their tools and I guess uh, the most important uh, takeaway from this picture is that this problem will not go away. Uh, there's plenty of money in that criminal market and there are there's an increasing number of takers for that money. Uh, so we can expect that there's going to be continuous development of those tools. There are going to be ransomware campaigns targeted to end users and there's a pronounced need to uh, provide protection against uh, ransomware attacks. Now, in the context of GDPR, one might argue that if my computers get infected with ransomware and only thing that it does is encrypt files, rendering them inaccessible and then uh, ransoming that, you could argue that at least the information was not leaked and you would not be required to notify the authorities and the, the victims or your customers. And I would argue that this is not the whole truth. Actually, the integrity of your data processing has clearly been violated. Somebody else is in control of systems that are being used to store, handle and transmit personally identifiable information. It is only a minor, minor uh, change in the malware code that would enable the criminal to actually exfiltrate that information for them to be shared, leaked or uh, sold to the highest bidder in the future. So in, in that sense you as a victim of ransomware would not want to further give any, any, any further controls to the attacker but you would want to be in control of the situation yourself and in that sense protecting against commodity malware, protecting against ransomware is actually very much a GDPR compliancy action. And of course ransomware is a prime example of a, a sophisticated enough commodity malware that has been written and shared by a deterministic attacker who actually is not that interested in targeting you specifically but that they are interested in exploiting any lapses of your security posture. So if you are worse, protected worse than your competitors, I guess you will be more likely to fall for ransomware as well. Okay, um, the examples that I talked uh, were about external threats which of course when you consider uh, our company's uh, positioning and the, the products and solutions that we offer that is only a natural thing to to speak about but of course as an CISO you would need to be mindful of the threat that would be coming from your uh, staff members, your partners and uh, even the customers who are supposed to be insiders as well in, in, in certain case. And if there ever is a case that you are uh, faced with the possibility that your customer database or your uh, uh, 
data that has any relevance to GDPR is being leaked or it is being uh, its integrity has been violated you always need to be in a position to identify who has had access either read access or modification access to the systems that are being used to handle that data or who has had high enough privilege levels so that they have been in a position to actually cause that harmful situation that you are now investigating and it would look extremely bad if you would be uh, in a position that you are not able to identify the, the limited group of potential suspects and you would not be in a position to provide evidence of what they did inside the system and with the data. And of course these insiders will not be necessarily, they will not be using malware, they will be using the existing credentials, existing legitimate and managed systems, computers and service servers and they would be doing stuff that looks awfully lot like the, what they are doing on an everyday uh, as part of their everyday routines and yet you would need to be in a position to identify anomalies. On top of that the data processing runs on software and software always has bugs and those bugs sometimes they cause unanticipated results and when you are for instance performing big data analytics and your source code contains a bug that would actually accidentally modify or, or destroy that data you would also need to be in a position to identify when it did happen, which component caused, caused that uh, unfortunate situation to occur and how to recover from that. All right, and I already touched on the uh, topic of detecting uh, anomalous stuff. So uh, the, the regulation requires that you would be in a possession of an, uh, kind of a ticketing system or at least some sort of bookkeeping system that you would record the breaches that you have become aware of. And uh, this, and I have to reflect this to my past uh, when I was working for a telecommunications provider that was uh, subjected to quite similar requirements that a breach would be required to be notified to the authorities. In practice, and this is a pro tip for everybody who is in, new in this situation, you would actually need to discuss with your legal department about when a breach would be above the threshold of uh, having to be report, reported to external parties. Since when you start uh, monitoring for breaches, when you start documenting those breaches, you find lots of uh, 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 incidents that at a, at a more in-depth uh, investigation turn out to be wrong alerts, so false positives. You don't want to be flagging false positives to your customers or your regulators. There are going to be cases where you find that some security controls have been bypassed or breached, but in effect nothing harmful took place and of course your information security management system needs to be in a position to have a statistical marking of these types of incidents and yet these 
quite possibly are not going to be above the reporting threshold. You're going to have incidents that actually were successful, but only uh, resulted in a limited uh, damages. So you were quite possibly able to successfully contain and repel those attackers. And that would be really, really uh, important information when you make a decision whether to report that incident or not, and in which fashion you would frame that report when you eventually decide to disclose that. Of course, whenever you set up any access control systems, whenever you set up uh, security software, whenever you set up your own processes for information security management, you would want to test whether the, those controls are effective. And of course, that would require that you um, so-called, you perform so-called red teaming exercises to test whether your security controls actually are in a position to prevent those attempts or at least detect when things go wrong and uh, things start to fall apart. And of course, when you test those uh, uh, controls, you will be feeding to the predict part of this cycle so that you can up your defenses for the next wave of attacks. So this has to be treated as a, uh, as a loop, like uh, those who, who know, like ODA loop would be. Um, there's quite a lot debate about whether it is actually impossible to prevent these attackers from succeeding and whether we have already as a defender, whether we ha have lost the game. And I guess th this, this has been called a uh, defender's dilemma. There's an, an idea that as a defender, you would need to be successful 100% of your time and the attacker only needs to choose the time, the place and the method of an attack and they will be successful at least when they repeat the attacks uh, often enough. All right, that would be pretty fatalistic. In real life, if an attacker wants to actually accomplish something, if they have a target in mind, i.e. that would be ransoming, that would be stealing information, that would be stealing control of your systems, that would actually require that the attacker succeeds in multiple steps in breaching and compromising your systems, and that they would be persistent in a fashion that they gain control of your systems for extended period of time. And now, if you are wise about populating your networks and systems with uh, protective technology, you would actually turn your systems a pretty hostile place for the attacker to operate. If an adversary wants to control your IT systems and exfiltrate critical information or huge volumes of information, it is increasingly difficult for them to stay undetected. And this is what we call the attacker's dilemma. And this is what we want you to take advantage of. The attackers actually have really, really, really difficult, difficult place in operating undetected if we use whatever technical means there are possible. So, things don't stop to detection. Of course, when we detect that something has taken place, we need to be able to respond to that. And GDPR actually has quite a number of uh, controls that would enable 
and that would uh, actually force organizations to to uh, respond to uh, identified breaches and and anomalies and I guess the the idea with the regulator is that if you are not seeing your own interests if you're not seeing after your own interests or if you are not voluntarily seeing after your customers interests they want to be in a position to evaluate you and hence in article 33 there's this requirement for the organization to notify the authorities the data protection authorities within 72 hours of uh, a breach being uh, detected and of course the notification requires that you actually demonstrate to the authorities that you know what happened, what is the impact and fallout of that incident. It requires that you have an, some kind of hunch of what has happened in the past, what enabled the attackers to be successful, and this is your moment to shine and let the authorities know what security controls you had in place that at least attempted to make uh, it harder for the attackers to succeed and what made their success more limited than it would have been otherwise. All right, so in that sense you want to be in a position where if there would be a breach you would be not ashamed to report it to the authorities. But it doesn't end there. The Article 34 requires that the data subjects, which in, in practical terms would be your customers, need to be notified as well. And of course, if there are no affected customers, you would be pretty much off the hook. And if on the other hand, if you have millions of customers, notifying them will in effect make this incident quite public. And this is something that I, I already see that it's going to change the landscape in Europe. So far, the majority of information security incidents that are being reported in public number domain in the media are incidents that have been, have been taking place in the North American continent and that is not due to the fact that they would be not that good in securing their systems. Uh, if the last time that I counted 46 states in the US have already implemented similar notification requirement as the GDPR will in, uh, uh, enable next year in Europe. So our US counterparts have had plenty of time to learn to live with the requirement to notify their customers and that has helped at least the US based media to be pretty vigilant in reporting those incidents and starting May next year we're going to see much more examples of data breaches affecting European-based customers and European-based businesses and I'm still I still have a bet ongoing bet of what is it that will become the customary standard reaction in European organizations to these data breaches. Uh, for uh, American companies, when the customer information has been leaked, it is a standard practice to offer uh, one year uh, credit monitoring service for free for those customers. Uh, and I'm not sure what would be the European equivalent of uh, kind of a trying to make amends to the affected customers. All right. 
uh, I guess before we go to the Q&A session and, um, and the discussion with Art, uh, I guess this is an attempt of me trying to be funny, but since I'm not the lawyer, uh, I try to kind of uh, get the quick read on all the new laws that are being passed that we need to be compliant of. And of course, if you want to know how non-compliancy will affect you, you start by reading the, the penalties section of the law. And here's the, uh, the penalty section of GDPR. So, being an engineer that I am, I would first read the maximum penalties for non-compliance. And we see that there's this 4% annual turnover or 20 million euro fine, which is not uh, a criminal uh, uh, offense, but it is something that the administrative, uh, the, the data protection authorities order you to pay as an administrative fine. So, if you want to avoid paying those amounts of uh, administrative fines, you want to make sure that your organization is compliant to these four articles, articles five, six, seven, and nine. And they, in effect, they would require that you have uh, designed your system in a fashion that you have privacy as a default, if you will, and you have a life cycle management for the data so that you actually know when to get rid of unnecessary data and how to do that. All right, the smaller administrative fine requires you to actually be compliant to quite a number of additional articles. So I guess in the list of priorities, take those articles five, six, seven, and nine as a priority one, and then not a priority two, but a priority one A would be the articles from eight and 11 and so forth. All right, for a serious lawyer and a privacy officer, of course, this will not be enough and you might want to as a CISO, keep these, this line of thought to yourself, like I have not so successful, not, uh, <laughs> like I haven't done it not so successfully. But uh, I guess you have to be mindful that, that in order for you to actually perform well in the anomalous situation and in the situation of your company being hacked into, you would need to have quite many things put in place beforehand. So there is now almost one year to put your house in order and that would require that you consult with your business owners. This is your moment to start discussing with your uh, IT and development teams. And this is your time to uh, find that the privacy officers are your ally, not your enemy in this sense. All right, and I guess at this point of time, it would be good place to, to move on to questions and discussions if you will. Hey, Erka, if correct, you can hear me again. Um, yes, I can hear you. I can hear myself somewhere in the, in the background. Hey, thanks a lot for this, um, for this uh, explanation on, on, on GDPR. And um, first question that came to mind also with Bert is, in the end, and maybe I, I, I should have asked this question, but is it possible to be 100% compliant? I think this, this, this will be one of the biggest nightmares of especially a lawyer or uh, an assistant administrator because there are so many aspects to take in, 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 in care. Do you think we as a company are 100% compliant? What, 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 what should you think? 
well. And uh, I guess as an information security professional, I want to separate between being a compliant and actually being secure. We and uh, everybody wants to be compliant in a fashion to protect against legal liabilities. So compliancy doesn't necessarily translate to you being safe from becoming a target of a breach. And that would be foolish for everybody to, uh, for anybody to promise. So at this point of time, GDPR is something that your top management, your board of directors, and your shareholders, if you have, will be interested in. They have keen interest in finding out whether you are compliant. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are interested in finding out how secure your business is, but they want to limit the exposure to legal liabilities if it turns out that you have failed to implement some necessary steps of that regulation. And of course, when you start implementing various articles, there's lots of room for interpretation. There's a place where things are free formed. You can choose your approach. You, have, you can choose which depth you go into when you are implementing. And the biggest, uh, I guess the, the most pressing advice I can give you to is that you try to be balanced, you try to document your plans, and you have enough documentation to prove that these plans have already also been implemented. And in that sense, you can, pre, you can be pretty compliant and yet your information security might still have gaping holes and you might have areas that you know that are quite risky and GDPR as a regulation and I would expect that the way it's being enforced in the future leaves room and is actually pretty understanding for the fact that the attackers are not going to go away and the attackers are going to be successful in some cases, but you would need to be in a position to actually act accordingly when a breach will take place. Mm -hmm. So yes, 100% compliancy is achievable, 100% security is not. I think that's that that's a clear answer and you know when we talk to our customers we already see a, a lot of stuff happening with regard to this GDPR regulation and um, so I guess this kind of answers my question but do you think this GDPR positively contributes to a better um, state of business with regard to security or do you think it really adds to um, the way we implement things uh, so it, it, it's it's about the form not the content what what's your opinion about that I honestly think that GDPR is is a step in right direction and uh, I have several uh, reasons to believe that the one thing is that there was and there still is uh, a degree of um, indifference towards uh, handling sensitive personally identifiable information in many organizations and when you do when you get away with uh, anomalous uh, uh, incidents when you get away with outright breaches and when as an organization, you don't need to uh, answer to your leaders and board of directors about your uh, preparation for these attempts. 
I guess you never get resourcing and you never get funding and you never get the the attention that it requires. So this is GDPR in that sense is a great way to boost uh, okay. whatever security initiatives there are in the organizations uh, uh, in the first place. And then the second factor is that GDPR actually forces organizations to put the data subjects, that is the customers, in the center. It's not just that you as an organization, you are protecting yourself, but you need to be mindful that you are responsible of protecting your customers as well. Yeah. Sorry for giving such a long answer. No, no, no. Um, um, I, I really appreciate that. Um, um, and the next question, I think you also already answered it, but and, and maybe this is a tricky one, but to some extent, don't you think it's a pity that GDPR is needed to come to this new state of security business? Um, well, yeah, in a fashion, you might feel a bit cynical that it requires a regulation that is so heavy on the administrative fine side of things. Um, so that is a symptom of the regular regulators actually growing a bit impatient about the slow progress in the European continent. So they wanted, the lawmakers wanted to artificially uh, change the incentives for organizations to to invest in security. So yeah, it's it's you could argue that this is a depressing way of looking at things, but on the other hand, now that this regulation is a reality already, we should now accept the fact that we have to comply and we should comply in a smart fashion. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, Edgar, I have also one question. First of all, thank you for your pre-presentation. Uh, my question is related to small business and, let's say, uh, a one-man show like a dentist or a doctor. Need the, uh, is there also needs for the GGTPR? And, you know, if you're talking about executive and team and board, so I can imagine that they don't have this. So. How do you think that they can uh, be a little bit, let's say, compliant or more secure? So, uh, yeah, small businesses typically don't want to invest through any money and resources to support functions. So they will not hire a CISO, they will not hire privacy officers and they don't want to invest in IT and network uh, networks and uh, storage capacity. So in that sense, the device is that the, the more clever and smart move for a small company is to move everything that is not essential for their business to a partner and that, that means that it's outsourced. And require that partner to be compliant to the GDPR uh, regulation. And that would require that you specifically ask for that provider to be uh, GDPR compliant. Okay. And that might require that you, uh, you choose between, for instance, European-based data processing instead of uh, data processing that would take place outside the European Union. Okay, yeah, true. Okay, and we have five minutes left, I see, so maybe we um, should go over to some questions we already have in the chat from uh, our audience. Um, if other people have some questions, please do not hesitate to uh, to ask them. Uh, but here's, here's um, well, uh, not a funny one, but I think this is... Um, uh, the question is, is F-Secure applying these solutions itself and how did they help F-Secure in becoming GDPR compliant? Is this something you can answer to some extent? Sure, yeah. Um, of course. Um, of course, internal matters are all, always internal, but one thing 
worth mentioning is that as a company, in the past, we used to be quite a lot consumer oriented in our product portfolio. And when you are providing consumer software and being privacy conscious about that, one thing to actually become compliant and one thing to actually become a privacy champion is to aggressively limit the amount of personal data that you collect from a customer. And at FCGR we have had a long-standing policy where we are not selling our software in exchange for your personal information. We are in that sense, we're a pretty old fashioned company that if you want to purchase our software, you pay for it by using money. Some of our competitors actually seemingly provide software as a free freebie and then they download and suck all your personal information, all your behavioral information and sell it to the highest bidder. And that has never been our approach. So in that sense, we have had a pretty good and strong footing in that, uh, that aspect already. However, now that we are becoming and we have turned ourselves to become a cybersecurity uh, provider, and we are now targeting corporations and enterprises, it has actually forced us to start collecting quite a lot information about uh, the threats that we see, the incidents that are facing our customers. And a prime example of that would be the service called Rapid Detection Service, where we are actually detecting advanced attackers that are no longer using malware. And for that, we need to obtain consent from our customers to to detect, collect, correlate huge amounts of information. And that, of course, has forced us to come up with ways to pseudonymize information or anonymize information and use cloud-based resources for big data analytics in a fashion that will, will not violate um, uh, data protection rules and the 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 privacy promise that we have towards our customers so you would argue that gdpr came at a right moment for the journey of our company okay great um a, a more technical question maybe you can't answer it but then then maybe bert it's um, um I, I, uh, let me have a look here. What exactly does it say? IT incidents, you register in service management tools, like for example, Topdesk, which you have more of them. Are these useful or compliant for GDPR breaches as well? And, and you referred to IT monitoring tools. E e yeah. No, it's more related to, um, you know, if you, you know, when you have an IT incident, you want to register them and you have a tool like Topdesk or some other tools. Mm. And they want to be, uh, they want to be sure or they, know, they want to know if they are then compliant as well regarding GDPR breaches. Yeah. And I would argue that definitely if, if you have a system where you would create tickets, where you would delegate and escalate incidents and investigations already, where you have troubles and solutions documented and people accountable for whatever investigations and problems they are working on. That is, of course, something that GDPR requires you to do. And if you have a system like that in place already, you are on your path to compliance in that sense. If you want to make it even more lean, you integrate those solutions with live freed from IDS systems and your antivirus or, or other sources for uh, technical incident and event 
uh, material, yeah. which would make it self-documentating in a fashion that you have a document trail of incidents even before you noticed them. Cool, cool, Erka. And and that, that answered the question we can see now in the chat. So thank you for that. We have some more questions, but uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we cannot answer them. It's 2 o'clock, so we book time till 2 o'clock. Uh, please do not hesitate to send your questions. Uh, questions that are unanswered, uh, we will come back to them. We know where we where they came from. So again, thank you um, for attending this uh, this second webinar of the year. Uh, thank you, Erica. Uh, I think it was a, a great presentation, and we learned a lot. Uh, and yeah, for the audience, please um, look out for the next invitation and the next great topic we will talk about. Uh, but for today, thanks for your attention and uh, see you next time. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.